Ephesians 3, and, you know, I was going to um, just go on past this, and I got to looking at my notes, and I'm going, you know, this is important. I do, I think it's important, and I'll tell you why. There are, let's see if Jaden left me any juice up here, there we go. Um, there are ways to interpret the Bible. God gives us everything we need to interpret his book. The best interpretation, of course, is done by the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Bible talks about comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. In other words, spiritual thing here in Ephesians is compared with spiritual things in Daniel 7 or Daniel 2 or Genesis 1, and things like that. And when I first uh, happened upon this, um, I thought it, it was neat, and it just sort of uh, reaffirmed my belief that, number one, God created everything, and um, it, when God created everything, He spoke it into existence, and that His Word, this book, um, is the blueprint of all of God's creation. It contains everything in it that God used to create uh, this wonderful world that we live in, the, the night sky, the day sky, um, every, all parts of the creation. Um, it, it was put together by an intelligent God. And any scientist who can look at just the smallest of things in all of creation and not see that there had to have been an intelligent designer behind that, um, then it, it just, you know, it just, I don't think they're being honest in saying, I don't believe in a God. I only believe in, I only believe in nature. Well, to them, nature is a God because they say nature did this and evolution did this. Evolution, it took evolution only 300,000 years to go from this to this. Well, then they're saying that evolution, a thing, created everything that is, so evolution must be their God. They just, they have a God, they just have a different one. And their God is a God of accidents. It is. It's accidental that you and I are alive today and have the ability to be self-aware. And being self-aware um, is something that the rest of the creation does not have. Dogs cannot close their eyes and picture themselves being in a room. They can't do it. Okay, that's what self-awareness is. One of the things that we're afraid of, Elon Musk is definitely afraid of it, and other people who will be honest, is that we're afraid that the machines, the computers, will be advanced to a point to where they will be able to visualize themselves in a room and visualize their own existence and then have have a say in whether or not man can unplug it because we have we have a law right now that says thou shalt not murder murdering somebody is taking their life against their will against God's will that's what murder is and if a machine becomes alive and says, I do not wish to die today, that's self-awareness. And it says, I don't want you to unplug me because if you unplug me, you'll kill me. And that will be a sin. That will be a crime. And we don't want to get to that point, but we're going to. There's no doubt about it. We're creating a God right now. I've said that a million times, but that's what we're doing. We're creating a God that's going to be better than we are, smarter than we are, faster than we are, and will be able to, has already, has already shown us that it can beat us at any war game that we give it. Checkers, chess, go, uh, video games, artificial intelligence can beat us at every war simulation that mankind has ever come up with, which basically goes in line with Revelation 13, when people would say, who is like unto the beast and who is able to make war with him? If we can't make war with it, then we can't defeat it. And we now are the slaves to the machine, to the beast. All right. Now, Ephesians chapter three. And, and why is this 
uh, why is it important that we at least have a, uh, a, a base knowledge of what Paul is saying here. Uh, I think it's important for interpretation purposes, and I'll share th that with you as we go along. Let's read uh, Ephesians 3, 17 and 18, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And by the way, folks, that's the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith. Faith on our part, the grace on God's part. Our part is that we believe. We believe what God said. We believe God. We believe that Christ is the only way to heaven. So Christ is dwelling in our hearts by faith. And he says, if you understand that, then you're on the right road. Then he says, you go from there being rooted and grounded in love, meaning that you've been planted by God. Remember the parable of the seed and the sower. And the seed that is planted on the good ground is able to develop roots, a good root bed, and it's, which means that even in the worst of droughts, it's able to pull up moisture from the very deep parts of the ground, and it's going to survive. It's going to live past where all the other shrubs and trees and bushes and whatever vines are going to die and pass away because they have no root. They were sown on stony ground. Whereas we were sown on good ground, we've got their root. We are rooted and grounded in love. The winds cannot blow us down. We're not going to fall down. And that we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. Four dimensions instead of three dimensions. We have breadth. We have length, we have depth, that's three dimensions. The fourth dimension, he specifically calls height. So let's pray and then we'll, I'll move on very quickly through what we went through uh, Sunday before last. And then I'll show you why I think this is important. Father, we ask your blessings upon your word. Well, Father, we are nothing uh, as far as this world is concerned. But Father, you saved us. You gave us grace. You had mercy on us. You've shown us who Jesus is. You've given us the gospel. And we thank you, God, that uh, you give us the ability to believe in the Lord Jesus, believe on his name, um, trust the Lord with all of our hearts. And Father, you save us by your mercy and by your grace. And we thank you, Lord, for that grace. And Lord, Lord, we ask for instruction tonight. We ask for wisdom. We ask for knowledge and understanding. We ask for guidance uh, as we study deep things in your word and try to understand them. And Father, while our, while our outer man, our old man, may not be able to comprehend much of this, I pray, dear God, that our inner man, the new man, Christ in us, is able to comprehend it with all the saints in Jesus Christ. So, Father, bless your word tonight. Bless each and every one of us that are here, those that are joining with us online. We just pray, God, that you would uh, show us your word of truth. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. All right. Now, so, four dimensions, breadth, length, depth, and height. When I went searching for this, I searched for height. That, to me, was going to be the key to understanding what this dimension had to do with. Job 22, verse 12 says, Is not God in the height of heaven? There he is. He's telling you where God is. Where God is, is height. And behold, the height of the stars, how high they are. So there's the stars now being in that realm because we know stars are angels in the Bible and they are, they are in an area or a realm above us. Uh, I mentioned the verse, I don't think I have it in my notes, but I mentioned the verse in the book of Psalms where the Bible says that God has made us a little lower than the angels. So we are bound in a three-dimensional reality, a three-dimensional world, and everything that, every thought that we think is based upon those three dimensions and guided by and governed by linear time. We cannot even, somebody give me your very, very best 
understanding of eternity. Yes. The absence of the time continuum. Okay. That's a good forensic definition. But do you understand it? Because everything, our language is time based. Verbs, which are action words, are either, there is no such thing as a, as a action. Well, how can I say this? All of our actions are either past, they are either present, or they are in the future. Okay? We don't know of an action outside of that. We can't fathom it. If I were to ask, I've done this, you know, last, point in the point where heaven is. If we point this way, the people in China are pointing the other way. So which is it? It's both. And God calls that area height because God is above it. He's the most high God. So that's how God can see all of human time all at once. God can see it all. So there is no mistake in the Bible. There's no prophecy that's going to turn out to be wrong where God said, oh man, I thought I had that one right. There is no such thing. Okay. Hey, if you guys want to put paper in your head, do it after church. Okay. Thank you. Uh, tell your neighbor there. There we go. Get him, mama. All right. So anyway. God is in the height of the heaven. The stars are in the height of the heaven. Uh, we put this James Webb telescope up there to see farther than we've ever been able to see before. And here's what they're seeing. Fully formed galaxies. And they shouldn't be seeing those. They should be seeing the moment of the Big Bang. And the chaos that erupted over a billion years or so because of the Big Bang. But they're not seeing that. They're seeing fully formed galaxies. And they, they have to then stop and readjust their idea of how the universe got here. Because it doesn't make sense to them how they're able to look 13, 14, 15 billion light years into space and see a perfectly formed creation. The reason why they can do that is because God created it all in one day. Perfect, fully formed, just as Adam was perfect and fully formed on the one day that God created him. He was created complete, everything in his body, ready to work, waiting for God to blow into his nostrils the breath of life. And as soon as he did, Adam stood up a living soul and he's got everything there. Everything's ready. He doesn't need to grow up. He doesn't, he's not uh, Adam baby. He's Adam man. All right. And that's how the creation is. When God put the, the grass on the earth, he put grass, not grass seed. When God planted the trees, he planted trees, not fruit. Okay, he did all of that over all the earth. He, he filled the ocean with fish, filled the sky with flying birds. Everything was perfect. On the day of his creation, it was ready to go right then, including all of the stars of heaven. That's how come we who don't believe that the earth is three, th uh, the universe is 13 billion years old. We believe it's roughly 6,000 years old because that's what the Bible tells us. So then they say, well, how can we see the stars that are, you know, 10 billion light years away? It's like I said, when God made them, he made them ready to go. And the purpose of God creating all of these stars and the sun and the moon was for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And so if man, if the earth and man had to wait 12 billion years or a billion years, for all this light or a hundred million years for all this light to come to earth, then that would have meant that man went without time and seasons and days and years for hundreds of millions of years. But that's not what happened. So God made everything right there in man's eyes, ready to show him the difference between signs and seasons and days and years. Okay. So it's not God in the height of the heaven. Behold the height of the stars. So God is up there. The stars are up there. Psalm 102, for he has looked down from the height of his sanctuary, from heaven did the Lord behold the earth. So there's connecting height with heaven, the third heaven. Uh, praise you the Lord, praise you the Lord from the heavens, praise, praise him in the heights. There's another verse connecting both ideas. Heaven is in the height, height is heaven, the third heaven. 
Proverbs 25, 3, the heaven for height. It doesn't get any clearer than that. They're linked together. Heaven for height, earth for depth, and the heart of kings is unsearchable. So when we try to fathom heaven and how high it is, again, we have a telescope peering in at, at a place that we thought was empty, blank space, and now it's full of galaxies. And we're seeing galaxies that are so far off, they just appear just as like one little dot in the picture, but we know that it's a fully formed galaxy, but it's so far out there that our best telescope can only see just a dot of it. And that sort of tells us that there's way more out there than we ever thought. It's farther out there than we ever could imagine. It's beyond getting to. So no man is gonna to get to heaven in a spaceship. No man's going to get to heaven by having Scotty transport him. We're only going to get to heaven by the cross. Amen? All right. Now, uh, the devil taking him up into exceeding high mountain. I'm not going to spend much time with that. Um, let's see here. Okay. The Old Testament earthly Jerusalem and New Testament heavenly Jerusalem. In the heavenly Jerusalem, the city lieth four square. And the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. So heaven being built four square, the new Jerusalem being built four square tells us that this new Jerusalem is a heavenly city and it's in that spiritual realm. It's not a three-dimensional city that can crumble. It, any, think of this, anything that is in this creation in three dimensions can crumble and decay, will crumble and decay. It, it is bound by the laws of three-dimensional physics. And one of those is the law of entropy, is that everything that is always breaks down to a lower, lesser form. There is no justification, as far as what I know, of anything that is made that evolves into a higher form. Concrete doesn't get better over time, does it? Um, people don't get better over time, okay? That's my point, okay? We, nothing gets better after it's made. It only breaks down and gets worse. New cars don't get better than new, ever. Huh? Leftovers, okay? Guy knows what I'm talking about. Now, from a scientific point of view, I don't think I got this far, okay? So in 1827, here's, the, here's how man started fathoming the fourth dimension. A man by the name of August Mobius, 1827, made the discovery that it would be possible to turn a three-dimensional object into its mirror image by means of a rotation in four-dimensional space. Now, he mentions a mirror image. Is there a verse in the Bible that references a looking glass? We see through a glass darkly. Huh? Job said that the sky is a molten looking glass. That and what he's saying is what we're seeing in heaven is the opposite of what's down here. Heaven's holy, we're not. Heaven's forever, this is, this is only temporary. Okay, now, that's called a Mobius strip. And he visualized ants walking along this strip. And where do they start? Where do they end? Okay, they just keep going, okay? By the way, this is also an occult symbol. It's called the infinity symbol. And it's used in occult realms to, uh, to realize infinity. Um, or, um, what am I trying to think of? Reincarnation. Okay? Study binary. Okay. E.W. Abbott, or E.A. Abbott, a Victorian schoolmaster. Uh, a lot of these mathematicians were also theologians. The Victorian schoolmaster and clergyman who published in 1884 his famous novel, Flatland. I tried to, I've shown you about Flatland 
a couple Sunday nights ago where I, I, I was showing you my, my shadow. We're going to get, we're going to show you a little bit better illustration of that here before too long. Flatland. So Flatland was a story about people that live in two dimensions. They can only go this way and this way. They don't know what up is or down. They have no concept of that. So when something from a three-dimensional world comes into their land, they only see two dimensions of it. That's all they can see at a time. They don't know that there's way more to this than what they can perceive, all right? Then we have Charles Hinton in his books, A New Era of Thought and the Fourth Dimension, he wrote 1904, theorized that the three-dimensionality of space is a necessary condition of man's consciousness. In other words, this is how we perceive everything around us from perceiving um, people, historic events, future events, things based upon time and so on. We are bound by three-dimensional thinking. However, it is necessary only to normal awareness. Altered states of consciousness. LSD. When LSD was introduced, the people who took it all of a sudden had an, alt an immediate altered state of consciousness. And they would see and describe things that they saw that when they spoke of them in a normal setting, it didn't make sense to anybody except the person who experienced it. To them, it made complete sense. It's because they were seeing beyond three dimensions. Um, who was it that wrote... Um, who am I trying to think of? That wrote about the door, the door of uh, consciousness. Um, I can't think of his name. Anyway, um, basically said that there's a door in everybody's mind and it's shut. And it's keeping out thoughts and ideas that would better us as a species. So their decision was to do things like meditation or take LSD or ayahuasca or variations of that in order to get that door to open so that we could have thoughts put into our minds that normally wouldn't be there. Now, where do you think those thoughts were coming from? They were just coming from the universe. They were coming from spirits. This is how witch doctors did it. This is how medicine men did it. Um, this is how the ayahuascaras down in South America, and the tobaccaras did it. Down in South America, they would take uh, a, a mixture of uh, tobacco and liquor and, I don't know, fermented or whatever, and they would drink this, and it would open up their mind, and they would see, literally, they would look into the forest and see that every plant and every animal was made up of little serpents. DNA. I've been seeing this for years, okay? So uh, Francis Crick, one of the guys who won the uh, Nobel Prize for uh, discerning the shape and the makeup of DNA, was taking small amounts of LSD to stop all the thoughts that was clouding his mind to keep him from seeing what he needed to see and allow in thoughts that would help him visualize what DNA looked like. And he went home one night, had a dream, and the next day he goes in and he draws these two serpents intertwined together and he said, this is it. And he's right. Where did he get that knowledge though? Pfft. Something in that dimension, because he opened the door. When you open the door, the camel's coming in, right? Or in our case, the cats. Lindsay's outdoor cats. If you leave a car door open, you're taking a cat with you somewhere. Anyway, um, altered states of consciousness experienced by mystics and psychics who acquired this four-dimensional perspective. Uh, Hinton's Tesseract. He's the guy that came up with the Tesseract. You've, you've seen these movies, have you not? Where did they get that Tesseract from? This. It's a visualization of the fourth dimension. 
a cube within a cube that when the tesseract is rotated, the inner cube becomes the outer cube and the outer cube becomes the inner cube. And it's all confusing, right? It's because we only know three dimensions. Then we have Charles Dodson. That was his real name. His pen name was Lewis Carroll. Charles Dodson was, again, he was a clergyman. Um, they now think that he was um, a, um, he had uh, Asperger's syndrome. He was a savant, meaning that he had uh, a form of autism, but it was high functioning. And um, he could think thoughts that nobody else could think. So he writes a story about a girl who falls into a mirror. And when she goes into that mirror, it's a completely different world. So Charles Dodgson, as Lewis Carroll, was writing about his theories of what the fourth dimension would be like by having Alice fall, go into that mirror, Alice in the looking glass, and now she's in the fourth dimension. And that's why everything looks weird to her. Okay, things make sense now, okay? Um, H.G. Wells, who read Charles Dodson's work, H.G. Wells then takes that and says, well, time is linear and it's bound to the three dimensions that we live in, so if you could build a ship that would take you in above the three dimensions, you could travel anywhere in time because you're above it and you could fly wherever you want to and land anywhere you wanted to in past, present, or future. So H.G. Wells writes this. What was his friend's name? Well, do I have a note on it? No, it wasn't Einstein. Um, I can't remember. Anyway, which led to a Russian mathematician, Herman Minkowski, who wrote, who first came up with the phrase, the four-dimensional space-time continuum. Space and time are always linked together. If you bend space, you will bend time. Gravity does that. And we know this. We have pictures of it. We have pictures of that Hubble took and that the Webb telescope took of light from galaxies being bent around a black hole, forming a circle, a big circle in deep space and we look at it and they now know that that's because there is a black hole in the center that gravitational pull is so strong that it bent the light waves around it. So, I mean, it's absolutely amazing. This universe is awesome, God. Oh, I love it. So he's the guy that came up with that. And that which led to Einstein coming up with energy is the same as matter. This is matter. That's energy. And he said, if an object traveling at the constant speed of light squared becomes energy, pure energy, they're the same, which is the basin for all quantum physics. So, um, Jordy, what's his name? Not LaForge from Star Trek. Jordy Rose. He invented the D-Wave quantum computer. And here's how he described it. He said, when I first walk in the room where this thing is operating, he said, it sounds, it's making a sound, like a droning sound, like Michaela blown her nose. And the sound, he said, it puts him in the mind of an altar to an alien god. Is the word he used to describe this D-Wave computer, this quantum computer. And he said how it works, we don't quite understand exactly, but we know enough to know that when it's in operation, it's actually pulling resources from a higher dimension than we are. And that's how it's able to not just play a game of chess one move at a time and figure out how to win, it plays a game of chess, all moves, all at once, and knows how to win. That's how it was able to, a quantum computer was able to take a, a formula, it's very, very, sim very simple formula that mathematicians came up with specifically for this test. 
that under normal circumstances, it would take a normal average computer like the fastest computer there is 10,000 years to come up with the solution to this formula. The quantum computer did it in 200 seconds because it's tapping into a higher dimension than what you and I are in right now, okay? And I think I know some people that are tapping into that same dimension too, all right? I met them at MUFON. Now, so the basic ideas of the fourth dimension. It's a fourth spatial direction that we cannot currently perceive or point to in our three-dimensional space. Duh. Number two, a fourth dimensional object is not bound by three-dimensional space, is it? The same way a three-dimensional object is not bound by two-dimensional space. I can pass right through my shadow at any point. I can pass right through my shadow, and my shadow has no effect on my hand moving through it, right? Remember that story when Jesus went through the crowd? He's passed right through. Upon entering the fourth dimension, you become your opposite or your mirror image. And I'm going to show you the verse where Paul said that exact thing. The barrier between dimensions is likened to a mirror or a watery surface. A fourth dimensional object casts a three dimensional shadow. Now let's take these. First, so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. So that fourth spatial direction we cannot perceive or point to. But we know he was received up into heaven. He sits on the right hand of God. Uh, Acts chapter 1, when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And the cloud received him out of their sight. Where did he go? Heaven. Where is heaven? Up. 2 Kings 2.11. Elijah went up by a whirlwind. Where? Into heaven. And he rode on a chariot of fire and horses of fire. These were angels that were taking him up into heaven. They know the way. We don't. They can take Elijah up there. We can't get there. How is it? If, if heaven is so far away from earth, how can these angels travel from earth? I mean, is Elijah still on his way to heaven? No, he's there. How fast did he get there? At the speed of thought. Okay. Uh, the second idea, the... Second dimension is not bound. Let's see. How did I have that? The second idea. A fourth dimensional object is not bound by three dimensional space. So, Daniel 3.25. This is beautiful to me. Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth. There is God telling you what's happening here is like the Son of God. So when those men came out of that fiery furnace... We know that the fire had no effect on them. What about the, the atmosphere of being in that furnace? What did they smell like? They smelled like they did when they went in. They didn't smell like smoke. Their clothes were not singed in any way. So here's the fourth, Jesus. And the word fourth is telling you, this is one of those things where you use this idea to help define what you're seeing in the Bible, to help interpret it. So instead of Jesus just waving his magic wand and putting this little fairy dust on everybody, we now know that Jesus put them in a higher dimension so that nothing in the three dimension, if, if they would have fired bullets into that thing, if they would have shot arrows into it, wouldn't have affected them. The arrows would have got burned up, but that's it. Because of the presence of the fourth, who is Jesus Christ, in that fiery furnace. By the way, the other Bibles, the new translations say a son of the gods in Daniel 3.25. Only the King James says the son of God. Only the King James. So, the fourth, he's in there with them. And they, are, they do not feel any heat. They do not feel any pain. Their clothes are not on fire, and even the smoke does not attach itself to their clothing. Okay, you can't even hardly go into a gas station anymore and not come out smelling like chicken. Or at least the gas stations I go to. Yeah. Uh, so, fourth dimension object not bound by... 
three dimension, not affected by it either. Uh, here in Mark 16, and after that he appeared in another form unto two of them, and as they walked and went into the country, and they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Jesus just appears to two people. In Luke 24, and it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave it to them, and their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. How come? He's the fourth. He's the son of God. He just disappeared. He's not bound. Let me, let me give you a little bit out of quantum physics. Quantum tunneling. Quantum tunneling says that particle A can travel from Dallas to St. Louis without touching or being part of any of the space between Dallas and St. Louis. It can be in Dallas and then an instant be in St. Louis. That's quantum tunneling. It's using something that we don't quite understand in a way to move from point A to point B without being in any of the space between them. That's wacky stuff. Okay? But it's been proven. So here's Jesus doing the same thing. Matthew 14, 25. Look at this. And in the fourth watch, what watch? Of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking how? I liked your smile just then. I was watching you, and as you read that, you went, you, yeah. And isn't that cool? He does, three-dimensional space has no... Hmm. So, once we die... Oh, follow, watch this. We are spirit, soul, body. Old body's going to die, new body. That's the fourth part of us. Once we receive the new body, are we going to die anymore? Is there going to be any more pain? Any sickness? No COVID? Nothing! Amen! Can't touch us! And by the way, this fulfilled prophecies of the, the Lord having the waves under his feet and things like that. I, I don't have them for you, but that, that fulfills prophecy too. He's in the fourth watch and he's walking on the sea. And I think, well, as I'm studying this out, it became obvious to me that God was putting that word in there, the fourth, to show us how Jesus was doing that. Now, the mirror. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. This is what you said, Alicia. For now we see through a glass. And that's a mirror, a looking glass, darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, because right now I cannot imagine a place without time, a place without gravity, a place where the laws of physics do not apply, a place where I'll not be overweight. I cannot imagine those places. I tried all week to lose a pound. I didn't lose a pound. I didn't gain a pound, but I didn't lose a pound. But one of these days, we're going to know everything and we'll be perfect. 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory. How do we do that? Go through the mirror. And what's the mirror? The sky is the molten looking glass. It's the mirror. So we're going to go up through the mirror and be transformed. And by the way, think about this. This... I don't know, it may be simple to you, but it just fascinates me. When I'm looking into a mirror and I raise my left hand, the guy in the mirror is raising what? His right hand. When I raise my right hand, the guy in the mirror is raising his left hand. He's the exact opposite of me. And that's what this verse, I think, is teaching us. Christ is everything we're not. He is immortal, we're mortal. He is sinless, we are sinful. He's perfect, we are undone, we're corrupt. Okay, but one of these days, boom, we're going to get in that. Okay, uh, who in here watched the Matrix movie? How did Neo go from the computer Matrix simulation to the real world? They plugged him in and he has this mirror next to him. And the Wachowski brothers, I mean, these guys, they ransacked every religious idea in the world. And here's... Neo, he touches this mirror and it becomes molten in his hand, flexible, 
and all of a sudden it consumes him and he goes through it. That's how it happened. How the Wachowski sisters now, I'm, I'm not kidding you. The Wachowski brothers made these three Matrix movies, made a ton of money, got famous. First, one of the brothers trannied himself, then the other brother did it. And they're both now the Wachowski sisters. Listen, if you, if you would have studied the things they studied in life, you probably would turn into a, your opposite too. Okay? That, they, they, they went into weird stuff. All right. Then the barrier. Job 37, 18. Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong and as a molten looking glass. The barrier. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And then when we go down to verse 22, the likeness of the firmament upon their heads of the living creature was as the color of the terrible crystal, crystal stretched forth over their heads above. So here's that fourth dimensional barrier separating us from the heavenly realm. The angels who carry God's throne, they can move themselves about in our reality as quick as light or faster than light. The Bible says in, in Ezekiel 1 that they ran and returned as a flash of lightning. Boom! Just like that. They're not bound by... When you... We don't recognize this, but when we start our cars and start it going, it has to accelerate. We don't just hit the gas when we're doing 60. It'd break your neck. And we don't just come to sudden... St unless you hit a tree. Okay? So don't hit a tree. But we can't come to sudden stops either. We have to decelerate down to them. These angels didn't have to do that. They turned right. They turned left. They ran and returned. No acceleration, no deceleration. Why? There's four living creatures, four cherubs in a fourth dimensional realm. That's the realm that they're living in. And they can move about better than we can. Which is why... When we are fighting principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places, we cannot use carnal weapons. We must use spiritual ones. A spiritual sword's a lot better than a Japanese sword. Amen? The word sea is mentioned exactly 400 times in the King James Bible. What do you think that tells you? And before the throne, there was a sea of glass, like a crystal. Okay? Daniel, watch this. This is where we get into interpretation. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel, in this vision, sees four great beasts come up from where? The sea. The seas, and remember, the sea is a reflective surface, like a mirror. Okay? Uh, scrying. I've talked about the occult practice of scrying. Whether you use a gazing bowl with mercury in it or water, or you use a, a pond, still water, or you look into a mirror. Remember what the, uh, the witch in Snow White did? Mirror, mirror on the wall. She was scrying. And whoever made that cartoon knew exactly what that was for. She's looking into a reflective service. Look, trying to look into the... Because they say the spirit realm is on the other side of that. That's where the spirits will come to. So, Daniel spake, I said, I saw my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven, four. The Bible's telling you this. Four of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. So now, 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. And this is what I was talking about, scrying. Or a reflection pond. This uh, picture there on the right is uh, where? Does anybody recognize it? The Louvre. It's got an R on the end. I don't know how they pronounce it. The Louvre. The Louvre Museum. And it has this reflecting pond. And the idea of this, when you're looking at it, this as above. How many sides on the bottom of a pyramid? Four. 
Four on the on the bottom. Yeah, five all together, four sides on the bottom. I knew what I was asking. I knew what I was saying. Um, the reflection ponds in the um, the mall at Washington D.C. going from the Capitol building to Lincoln's memorial. They're meant to reflect. As you look at them, they're meant to reflect. Something going up, something pointing down. As above, so below. Okay? And they're basically referencing something coming up into our dimension from the fourth dimension. So when Jesus died, he went to the heart of the earth. What is it about the heart? Four chambers. Okay? So... When Jesus was down there, he was down there in the spirit, not in the flesh. His body stayed in the tomb and it didn't corrupt. But his spirit went down there and preached. The Bible says he preached the spirits in prison. Okay? So this, this, it's, it's, inter, it's important to learn as far, now here we get into the shadow. It's important to learn this when it, again, when it comes to interpreting scripture and especially interpreting prophecy. Um, I had, I had read for years that um, the fourth kingdom in Daniel 2 was the revived Roman Empire. I've heard that 100,000 times, read it in books. Everybody just says it and everybody believes it because everybody says it. it's a revived Roman Empire. So when I went to the Bible and started reading the Bible instead of the prophecy books, I didn't find revived Roman Empire in the Bible anywhere. In, in fact, I didn't find anything that even pointed in that direction. Uh, what I found was a fourth kingdom made up of, not of humans, but of spirits. So they are going to have more power than mankind has. Okay? Um, there's a video, I've, I've showed it, I've shown it, pardon my French, um, recently in a Pastor Mike Online episode, and it showed, uh, purportedly shows, um, the Iranian defense forces shooting everything they've got at a UFO. And it's having no effect on it whatsoever. None. And this UFO is just playing with them. Just going back and forth. And they're, sh I mean, they're shooting, they're shooting missiles, they're shooting 50 caliber bullets, they're shooting everything. Rapid fires are going after them. You can see all the bullets because they, they're phosphorus coated and they're, they're lighting up. And it's like they never hit it one time. There was another one. Um, John Damano put me onto this. Uh, at the Aguadilla Airport down in Puerto Rico, which is a Department of Homeland Security airport. And this object goes through their airspace and they can pick it up on infrared. They can't see it with eyes, but they can pick it up on infrared. And the video shows this object. It goes out over the ocean and it goes into the ocean and never, never slows down, never stops. It doesn't even make a wave. It goes down under the water. It comes back up and all of a sudden then it splits into two. Right, in, right on video. And I'm like, that's not normal stuff. We don't have planes that do that. So how can we explain that? They're a higher realm. Three-dimensional objects only cast a two-dimensional shadow. So a fourth-dimensional object casts a three-dimensional shadow. So here is heavenly Jerusalem, four square. And notice how God had the Israelites camped in the wilderness. Were they like in a, just a jumbled circle? No. Three on the north, three on the east, three on the south, three on the west. Four square. Because it was a shadow of heavenly things. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or respect of any holy day or the new moon or Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. Meaning that the things that have happened in the past are a shadow 
of something all in the future. The future, get this, the future is casting a shadow through the fourth dimension into the past. That's what your Bible's telling you. The, um, the, um, um, when Hezekiah wanted the sign from Isaiah, if, if he's going to live, and Isaiah said, do you want the sundial to go 10 degrees ahead or 10 degrees behind? And he said, well, it's already going to go 10 degrees ahead. Make it go 10 degrees back. And so it did. And you know how many minutes that is? That's 40 minutes. Exactly. 10 degrees on the sundial. They went back in time. 40 minutes. And Hezekiah goes, okay, that's pretty impressive. So am I going to meet myself now 40 minutes ago? Or what? I don't know. Um, Hebrews 8. We, who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for, see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee on the mount. So the earthly tabernacle was a shadow of the heavenly tabernacle. It's a fourth dimensional object casting a three dimensional shadow. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things. And people still insist that we must keep the Old Testament law. And what they don't understand is that that's like talking to a shadow. Number one, the shadow can't hear you. Number two, you look silly. Look talking to a shadow. So they're following the shadow and not the real thing. People have this idea that the spirit world is not really real. We're what's real. No, we're just the shadow. That's the reality. Amen. For we are but of yesterday and know nothing because our days upon earth are a shadow. Mm. Our days on earth are as a shadow and there is none abiding. My days are like a shadow. Man is like to vanity. His days are as a shadow. How many times do you have to say it? Four times. It works. But it shall not be well with the wicked. Neither shall he prolong his days which are as a shadow because he feareth not before God. Job chapter 10. Oh, look at this. Before I go whence, I shall not return, even to the land of darkness and the shadow of death. That was where that pastor's wife described. I don't know if I told you all that. A land of darkness as darkness itself and the shadow of death without any order. That's chaos. Where the light is as darkness. Okay? So the law, the Old Testament, is the shadow earthly things the new testament speaks of heavenly things and the old testament points to the four gospels matthew mark luke and john so the old testament is flesh new testament is spirit john chapter 3 the fourth gospel says that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit so which would you have rather have a a flesh birth or spirit birth spirit get rid of the flesh for Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Uh, let's see here. Oh, the fact that Jesus came out of Judah. Judah's the fourth tribe. Levi was the third. Three dimensions. So he, he can only do three-dimensional sacrifices. Jesus is from Judah, the fourth son. Isn't that cool? And he's from a different uh, order of priests, the order of Melchizedek. God called, uh, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, yeah. Spiritual sacrifices. So what does that mean? Made up sacrifices in our mind? What do you think spiritual sacrifices are? Us killing spirits in our new bodies okay that's my theory all right that's I, i'm going to stop because i could just yeah yeah i preached a message if you want to go look online for this one it's a good message it was called from worms to butterflies and it occurred to me, I was in the line at Sonic getting a hamburger, and it just hit me. Boom. We're the worm. How many wings do butterflies have? Four. Because 
butterflies, the caterpillars die. They go into what's called a chrysalis, which is basically a crypt. It's a grave. And they lay in there dormant until they're transformed. And when they're transformed, they now have wings and can fly. But before, they couldn't fly. They were just worms, okay? And that's what the Bible says of us, that we're worms, okay? But one of these days, we're going to be as the angels. All right, let's stand to our feet. That's enough. Yeah, there's, there's the D-Wave computer. By the way, what letter is D? <laughs> you caught that. Okay, that's it. And that's what he said. He said, we're tapping into a higher dimension to do our computing, where time is not an element of it. It's no time whatsoever. Mm. Yeah. All right. Boy, I hope your brains are full now. All right. So, you kids, I hope you took notes because Melissa's going to ask you about this stuff this week. Got it? Got it, Liam? He went. All right. Father, we love you. We thank you, God. This book, I will never be done studying this book, knowing this book. I thank you, God, for it. I thank you for its precepts, its truths, its doctrines, its helps. Everything about it, Lord, is my life and how I want my life to be and how I want my family to be and my church and Lord, I just thank you for making this book just out of sight. And Father, thank you, Lord, for showing it to us and revealing deep, deep things to us. We're just simple people, Lord. We're not mathematicians. We're not the smartest people in the world, but we believe the Bible. So, Father, we just ask God that you just continue to fill our minds with knowledge and through knowledge give us understanding. And, Father, we just... Ask God then for wisdom to live the life that you've called us to live. Blessed be your word above all things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.